All right. Good stuff. Hi, everybody. <laughs> terrible. Just terrible. Who's having fun? Good show, huh? I'm a fan. Big show. <sighs> All right, my friends. We are, uh, I, is this the last talk of the day? Are we, are we closing it down? No? There's a keynote. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, okay. Uh, there's, a, there's another talk that was, that's going on right now about, you know, is your AI trying to kill you? And, uh, and, <laughs> and they're also showing Terminator Dark Fate in the theater. Is there a theme? Is there something going on? Is one coincident with the other? I don't know. Either way, my friends, we are uh, very, we have very short, we're very short in time as usual, so I encourage you, as usual, to take note of this slide wherein you're going to find all the information that you're going to need to follow along later. Not now. Please, don't Maven clean install stuff now, but later. Um, uh, you can find all the code that you're going to need for, for your own edification. And today we're going to talk about testing. We're going to talk about testing uh, all the way from the, from the smallest component all the way to the biggest, right? We're going to talk about building applications today. Uh, and of course, as usual, as usual, I encourage you to take note of this Git repository there. We can find all my information. Should you have questions, comments, feedback, whatever. You can find my email as well, so find that. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. I work on the Spring team. I'm a Spring developer advocate on the Spring team. Uh, I've been there for you know almost 10 years officially, officially more than that. I've got training videos in Safari, so you can find those. I did a book called Cloud Native Java. And this book I wrote a couple of years ago, it's a, it's a book all about how to build applications that are intended for the cloud. And this is really one of the things that really set me on this path of trying to really level up my testing game. Uh, because I, when I realized this, when I, really, when I wrote this book, you start to appreciate the value of continuous delivery. Right, and so we're going to talk about that in just a second. But really, this book is a is a good you know good uh, uh, sort of fire under your <clears throat> in order to get you moving into production. Okay, I also do a podcast every Friday. There's me talking to somebody who's out there who's out there doing amazing things. I have a blog every Tuesday called This Week in Spring, and of course every Wednesday I do a screencast called Spring Tips. I take a little bit of a break every now and then, so you know, 11 episodes at a time, and then I take a break. Right, and I'm writing a new book called Reactive Spring. So reactive programming is all about how to make uh, use of types that don't block the threads uh, and that allow other threads to be others, other things in the system to reuse those threads. And uh, we're going to use reactive programming today, but it's not really going to be our focus. There is actually, of course, a chapter in this book on which I'm working right now all about testing. Um, but we're going to talk about a lot of that today here together. So maybe you don't need to read that book, or at least not that chapter. Um, so we're going to talk about testing, okay? And we, what I care about is testing. I care about how to build applications uh, that uh, that um, I can move to production, right? I care about production. Ultimately, what I care about is production. Like I, I, I always say, production is the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. Uh, but if you haven't been to production, it can be a little intimidating trying to figure out how to get there and how to be sure that you've taken the right roads and the right paths to production. So testing is how you are sure of things. It is your GPS. It is the validation that you need to know that through every step of the way, as you move forward uh, in your code, you are making the right choices. You're delivering the right things. Okay, Testing, I don't think, is too controversial. Who has done testing before? I'm just curious. OK, well, some of you may not. Maybe you're PHP, right? You just test in production, right? Uh, <laughs> Just FTP it into the server and just start editing it there. Who knows? But um, uh, testing is, it, it should not be controversial. Hopefully it's not controversial in 2019 to suggest that you need testing. What may be uh, controversial is this idea that you should do test-driven development. And that's also what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about test-driven development, this very simple idea okay, that you write your tests first, and then you write your production code to make the tests pass. This is not a new idea, but it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's, a rel it's a relatively more controversial idea than this, this other idea that we should test. Obviously, we should test. You should all be testing. Um, but I think people struggle with this idea of test-driven development, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to move work from concept to customer. We're trying to take an idea that we've got at inception and move it through the various stages on the way to production, from concept to, to user experience, to developers, to administrators, to product management, to, to, uh, to production. And, to, uh, and, and in that chain, you've got all these different steps along the way where it becomes very important that you have validation, that you have an idea of what you're doing and what you expect to happen. And as you move forward and you move faster, it becomes even more, to ha more important to have that validation. This is the uh, the hallmark of continuous delivery, right? Jez Humble and, 
just humble. Uh, and uh, oh, Dave Farley. Dave Farley, thank you. Wrote a great book in 2009 called Continuous Delivery, which talks about this idea that you need to test everything, right? Because if you don't have these continuous valid validation feedback loops uh, on the way to production, then you can't be sure of anything. And what they're talking about is just testing something. They're, they're not talking about TDD. But my argument is that uh, testing, uh, if done afterwards, is something that you could forget to do. It's something that you may not do because you don't have time, right? So it's a problem. You need to have more rigor, more discipline when you, uh, when you move to production. And you need to have more rigor when you do your testing. The other argument I have is that testing, it's, it's not that fun. It's just not very, it's not a lot of fun if you do it afterwards, right? So think about the way most of us work. You write some code and you get it working. And, uh, and then you have that euphoria, that euphoric moment of like, oh, it's working on my machine. It works. I'm done. Go home, right? I'll test it later. I'll document it later. Very natural instinct because, of course, you've worked all day on this code and now you've got to do this extra chore. You've got to test it. Well, I've already, I've already proven it works on my machine, right? My machine is, is, is the cloud, so basically that's production, right? Or something. It's not a very, it's not a very satisfying experience, is it? It's not a very satisf satisfying experience at all. So most of us would do much better if we did test-driven development. And there's a few reasons for this, right? Test-driven development forces you to write the test code first. By writing the test code first, what happens? You write better code. And the reason that you write better code is because you have to write code that is testable. Well, how do you write testable code, right? You have to have code that you can extract out into small slices, small pieces, and then test in isolation. This means you have to write clean, object-oriented code where you can swap out or substitute parts of the object graph. This isn't controversial. This is just better code. So writing tests first actually gives you better code. It also gives you a sort of document that you can use to say, here's how this should work. This is what we expect to happen when you use this. This is the interaction with the uh, API that we expect and that we support. And like I say, it's more fun. And the reason it's more fun is because as soon as you make that test green, you've also shipped the production software. You get two for one. You're done, right? It's fun is very important here. When we do microservices, when we do continuous delivery, what we're doing is we're optimizing for lots of small, fast feedback loops, lots of little steps of validation, lots of little horizons to which we can make progress uh, in a continuous basis, right? We can continually move towards uh, goals or horizons that we can then reach. And this is very satisfying to the human brain. The human brain craves this kind of progress. It's very important to us, right? And you've seen it before. You've probably experienced this before. Have, who, who, who here has sat down at 9 o'clock in the morning and started writing code, and the next thing you know, it's 9 o'clock at night, right? Yeah, that's, and that's, that's why I think a lot of us stay in software. It's very satisfying. If you can have those days, those are the best. Are you kidding? I love those days. You don't even know it, you don't even know it happens. It just goes so quick. You start, and then the next thing you know, it's tomorrow, right? You just start writing code, and the next thing you know, it's tomorrow. You, were, you say, we, we say, as engineers, we say, I got into the zone. I love getting in the zone. The zone is the absolute best part. And we're not the only ones who say that. You know that, right? Engineers say that. Software engineers uh, say that. But other kinds of communities say that as well. People who jog, who run, right? They talk about getting into the zone. Anybody who says that they like to jog, they're lying. Nobody likes to do running. It's nonsense. What they like is getting somewhere. They like having gotten through it. They like having finished that, that tour and experienced the, uh, the grueling uh, uh, you know, heights just to be able to get to the final finish line. That's very satisfying. People who play video games get into the zone. Have you ever, know, have you ever known somebody who could sit down at 9 o'clock in the morning and then suddenly it's like 9 o'clock at night and they're still playing video games? Was it you? <laughs> right? Again, very easy. And the reason this is so easy is because the video game designers know about this effect. They know that people like to have lots of constant, satisfying horizons to which they can make progress that give them the sense that they're very close. If they just keep going just a little bit more, they're going to get to this next horizon and it's going to feel great. It's going to be very satisfying. Right? So these different industries all optimize for these fast feedback loops, these little horizons. Test-driven development is all about giving you these little horizons. If you do the other way around, if you write the software first, then you've already gotten to your horizon. Now you have to go do this thing again. You've, it's like playing the level over, over again. Nobody wants to do it again. You already did it. It's fine. I want to move to the next one. right? 
And also, the nice thing about test-driven development is because you're forced to think about small, discrete, easily achievable milestones, you can get there pretty quickly. You have lots of little satisfying steps to show on your journey to a bigger milestone, right? a bigger landmark. This is very important too, right? We, be, we don't want to have to like wait till the end of a whole bunch of code, uh, a whole bunch of coding, and only then do we start testing it, right? Just like with video games, nobody wants to, uh, nobody likes to play games that are super hard, that, that, take, that take all your time and you never get anywhere, right? People have done terrible things to themselves when they play video games that can't be beaten or that are just super hard, right? Flappy Bird was a, a good example. Do you, anybody here remember Flappy Bird? That game caused people to commit self-harm. It was so controversial, the developer took it off the game market, off the app, off the app store, because it's su super hard. So that same effect happens when you're writing code. If it's super hard to test, you're just not gonna, you're not gonna enjoy it. It's really, un, it's really dissatisfying. You wanna reach that milestone. The opposite is true, by the way, as well. Imagine you're working on something, and then somebody comes over and interrupts you for a meeting. Oh, it's the worst feeling, right? I'm in the middle of trying to get to the next horizon, and somebody's taking me out of the zone. Very dissatisfying. Just like with Flappy Bird, I can never get in the zone in this case. right? So all of these are all about optimizing for human fun. So that's what we're going to talk about today, my friends, is how to write t tests and how to explore the Spring ecosystem and integrate the Spring ecosystem. And we're going to write tests, of course. Of course, we're going to write tests today using my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place, of course, is production. And tests help you get there faster. So we're going to build a new application today using start.spring.io. We're going to use 2.2.1, which I think was just released today, which is nice. Uh, we're going to build a producer here, a producer application. And we're going to bring in some options. We have some choices that we have to specify. The first of which is the, is the choice of packaging. What kind of packaging do you want to use for your application today in 2019? A lot of people are confused by this. So let me do my level-headed best here now to explain when and where to, do, to use which option. If by some terrible freak accident of physics, you find that you have somehow been transported to the distant, distant, distant past. Far, 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 far beyond modern help. Then choose dot war. <laughs> But if you're here with me in 2019, then choose that jar. This is a big part of my overarching and guiding personal philosophy of make, no, make jar, not war. And again, you've got a lot of options, a lot of different things you could do, but I encourage you to stick with the defaults. I'm also going to use Java 13. My friends, there are a couple of options here. There are three different options here that you could choose from the for the choice of uh, Java version. Which one do you want to use? Uh, of these three, only two are correct, my friends. I'll give you a clue about which one is not correct. It's a clue. <laughs> I'm not saying it's this one, but it's this one, okay? This is the wrong version to use at all times. It's the wrong one. It's not just technically incorrect because it's less secure, less performant, less featureful. It's not just technically incorrect. It's also morally incorrect. <laughs> are you prepared to go home and have that discussion with your child that you're still using Java 8? No, of course not. No, don't do that. So use either the latest LTE version, long-term supported version, Java 11, or if you have a, a, a cloud platform that helps you move to the next version and you don't have to worry about m maintaining it and securing it, then just use Java 13, okay? Now, I'm going to bring in a few different dependencies. I'm going to bring in Lumbuck, which makes Java just a little bit more uh, productive. I'm going to bring in the reactive web support. I'm going to bring in the reactive MongoDB support, and I'm going to bring in the stub verifier, okay? So there's uh, verifier. And I'm going to hit Generate. That'll give me a new project, which I will open up, as usual, in my IDE. Here we go. Let me drink some water here. I feel like I've earned it. All right. So here we go. New application. Now, this is a brand new application. Uh, generated today, as you saw. So it's using the latest and greatest version of Spring Boot, um, and it's bringing in JUnit 5. Now, I think most of us are probably still using JUnit 4, and most of what I'm going to show you today uses and works with JUnit 4, as well as JUnit 5. So I'm going to show you to, the, to show it to you in uh, JUnit 4, but it's easy to map to JUnit 5, okay? Now, when you go to your code, you're going to see that there's two artifacts that are generated for you by the Spring Initializer. You have the, well, actually, there's three. There's three. You have the Spring uh, you have the palm.xml, and you can see that there's test support that's aut added automatically out of the box. You don't have to do anything to get that support uh, on the class path. There's that. There's also um, your pro producer application and your producer application tests. So again, 
This is a, 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 a generated test, and you didn't have to specify anything to get test support. We just assume, since it's 2019, that you're going to write tests. You do write tests, don't you? Don't, don't you? Everyone? This is awkward. I'm, I have to go. Look at the time. Uh, um, so you, we assume you're going to write tests, so there's no point in opting out of testing support. We don't even give you the option, right? You can do it yourself manually, but we don't want to be a party to that particular atrocity, okay? So when you generate a new project, it gives you a test class. Now, I'm going to be honest, I appreciate the test class. It's a nice, t it's a nice token, it's a nice gesture, but it's not a very good test. So I'm going to delete that test, okay? Um, and we're going to write a new test. We're going to write a very new test here, and we're going to start with the lowest level. Now, when you write, oh yeah. When we write tests, there's two ways to think about testing. One, when you do test from deal, one, one way to think about testing is to do testing from the smallest component all the way up, right? So you start from the smallest component and write code for the, you know, for the, for the uh, 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 object and then the entity and then the controllers and services and r repositories and all, you know, and then all the way up to the API or the user interface even, right? If you're building a microservice, your integration endpoint is not a user interface, it's, a, it's an API. Okay, a networked API. Um, but either way, you have some boundary that is the thing that people use to interact with your service. That thing, that ultimate thing, is the last thing you test in this style. You can do it that way. That's called inside-out testing. So you test small components and you work your way up to the big ones. In this strategy, it's very nice if you, you can use this strategy if you have two different teams, for example. And they're both working on different services, and they're both marching toward the point where there's going to be integration, but they're still trying to explore the lower level stuff. They're still worried about how to do persistence, they're trying to explore the domain, they're trying to explore the boundary of their particular service. And you're not so worried about the integration. You know that there will be an integration, but your teams are not ready to have that discussion yet. And especially if there's not a lot of risk, then there's no reason to think about that up front. So inside out is great if you have two different teams and they both need to move independently of each other concurrently and make progress in that way, okay? The opposite approach, opposite, the opposite being outside in, is also very useful in the opposite scenario. Suppose you have two different teams and you know that the integration is going to be very, very scary. That's going to be very difficult to do. And you want to take away the risk of that integration. In this case, you can prioritize building the integration endpoints, the APIs, the user interfaces, whatever, and figuring out that integration first, okay? So that's outside in. You can test, you can do test-driven development either way. It doesn't really matter, right? Um, it's up to you. In my case, we're going to build such a simple example today that we're going to start with inside out, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the tests first, and then I'm going to write the production code. I'm going to write a, a, a test that fails, just enough test to get it to fail, and then I'll write the production code to make it green again. And I'll keep doing this. I'll go back and forth. A lot of people do this with other people. They pair program. They sit two to a computer, two, two people, uh, two monitors, two mice, two, my, uh, two keyboard, but one computer. So you have somebody on one side write the red failing test. Not a lot, just a little bit. And then the other person writes the green code that makes the test pass. And you keep doing this. This is called red-green refactoring. It's like a game of ping pong, OK? Um, but you can also do it by yourself. Like, I'm going to do it by myself today. I'll just red-green refactor my way into production, right? This is also particularly easy if, like me, you have extra voices in the head, OK? It's going to be fine. Now, we're going to build a new class called a reservation pojo test. And this test is just going to test that I can create an object that gets, uh, that gets created correctly, OK? I'm not going to test persistent or anything else like that. I'm just going to test that I can create an object of type reservation like this correctly. And you can see I've already got a failing test, don't I? I need to create that class. So here's my class. And my class is going to be a thing that I'm going to map to my MongoDB database, OK? So this is the essence of my, uh, of my object. I want to prove that if I pass in an ID and a name, that it'll, it'll compile. Well, of course, it doesn't, so I need to create a constructor. I could create the constructor like this, but I quite like having um, all that done for me. So what I tend to do is to use Lumbach. Lumbach's a compile time annotation processor uh, that takes away a lot of the noise of creating getter, setters, two string, hash code, equals, and a constructor. So there's my basic object. I'm going to use just basic JUnit assert. And I'm going to say, hey, r.name should equal Jane. And the ID should be not null, right? I want to confirm that's not null. So there's ID and pass that in, OK? So this is my basic test. If I run this, let's see what happens. Test. 
compiler takes its time. Good. So that's green. But of course, if you're, if you, sometimes it helps to break the test. I'm going to make this say gen. I want to see if it fails because that way my test infrastructure is configured correctly. That's always very useful. You might have a great time feeling like everything is green when, in fact, nothing is actually running. So it was it broke. So that means that the testing is working. So that means that these were correct before. Now. These are very simple, easy tests to do. You can just say equals and not null and all that. Very simple kind of stuff. If you have a complex condition, a complex recipe that you want to capture, you want to describe and reuse in multiple places, you can create a matcher, right? And this is a nice thing to do with assert that. So here, I can say, I want the name to equal something. I can use Hamcrest. Hamcrest has a, a nice bunch of libraries, a, a, a nice um, a bunch of uh, test methods that says, OK, equals to ignoring case uh, Jane, OK? So that's a nice matcher. Let's see what that does. Okay, we'll run this. Now, Hamcrest provides a bunch of matchers out of the box. You can create your own matcher, but be careful here. You see, the type that it's, it gives you is called a matcher. So there's what the contract looks like. But you're going to see right now that uh, this isn't exactly what you, shouldn't be, what you should be doing. I think they're trying to communicate with us. <laughs> it's a little awkward. I wish they had just put that in the documentation a little bit front and center. This seems a little, this seems a little much. It, it, it seems like a little aggressive, you know? <laughs> and it's a bit of a pity, too, because now we have default methods. So they could have just actually provided the stuff that was supposed to be there in the base class, right? Um, so OK, we've got base matcher. OK, so we create a base matcher, all right? And there's our base matcher. And uh, the contract is very simple in a matcher. You just provide the methods that do the actual test here, right? So I can say, OK, well, um, you know, I want to have a condition. O should not be equal to null. This is a very simple example, OK? And if it fails, I can provide my own error condition. The name should not be null. So this way, you don't have to constantly recreate those error strings every time you want to have a matcher, OK? Um, oh, describe two. I was doing the wrong one. Descri describe match. I don't need that one. That's default. OK, there we go. So there's my basic test. So that'll work, of course. Right? That'll, be, that'll be just fine. Um, but I encourage you to just use the basics. OK, so we've got now an absolute basic one. Now let's create a, uh, an entity test. So I'm going to persist this to MongoDB. I've got MongoDB running in the background here. And I'm going to persist this object to the database. Now I've already got the database running. So I want to prove that I can persist this uh, object to the database as a MongoDB document, which is to say one row in a collection. A collection in MongoDB is like a, is like a table. So I'm going to have a row in that table. So I'm going to create a reservation document test. And what I'd like to do is to create a test class like this, public void uh, persist. And I want to say throws exception. And here, I need to persist the data to the database. I'm not trying to test that my object is valid. I'm trying to prove that it maps correctly to the database. That's what I'm trying to prove here. So in order to do that, I am going to create an entity like so, reservation R. And my assumption is that I'm, I'm going to pass a null for the ID column. And it should actually give me one from the database. And I need to persist this. Now, normally, in a Spring application, I would use a reservation repository. Okay, So reservation repository, repository. Well, of course, this type doesn't exist yet. So I'm going to create that type here. It's just an interface. Extends reactive CRUD repository, managing entities of type reservation whose string is of type, uh, whose primary key is of type string, um, and that's the thing I want to use. I could, you, you know, that this is just an interface. This is a Spring Data mechanism. I just create the interface. Spring Data provides the implementation for me, and uh, you know, I could recreate all that myself. I could actually call the objects and create them myself if I wanted to to get the same effect. But why? Spring already knows how to create that repository for me. I don't want to recreate it myself. And so what I want to do is I want to bring in Spring on this test. I want Spring to provide some of the machinery to test this application. So I'm going to bring in the Spring Runner. But I don't want to test the entire Spring application context. For example, by default, Spring is going to create a web application. I don't want to create a web application. I don't need that. I'm just trying to test the data tier. So I'll say at AutoWired, and I'll say, let's use a test slice. I could do Spring Boot test, but that would bring in everything. So instead, I'm going to use WebFlux test. WebFlux test is a test slice that brings in only the WebFlux components and the reactive non-blocking HTTP client and the support for JSON and the support for the Spring Cache abstraction uh, and all that stuff. Okay, I'm going to bring in all that, but nothing else. It's going to disable all of the other auto configuration. So now I have a WebFlux test. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I want data Mongo test. I want a test slice that only does the data access stuff. So it's going to bring in only the cache support and the Mongo support and nothing else. Right? It's going to disable all of the auto configuration. So now I've got this object. Let's save it to the database. Let's see what that looks like. Save dot 
R. Now, the return value of that is a mono. Think of mono as like a future on steroids, right? It's much more powerful. It has the ability to support multiple values. It's reactive. It doesn't block and so on. It's more like a completable future uh, plus plus, okay? Because it's an asynchronous value, you need to subscribe. So you can say save.subscribe, for example, and then that happens on a separate thread which gets very hard to reason about in your test. You have to somehow force it to resolve before the test finishes. So instead, use the step verifier. You say save, and you can use that to assert certain things about the results. I can say r.getID is not null, right? And r.getName is equal to uh, Jane, okay? And I can verify that it completes successfully, that the value asynchronously materializes successfully. So um, uh, res... Good, okay, there's that. So we can run this simple test. Uh, this is called a reservation document test. We're gonna pers persist that. Okay, so there's the test. It worked, it's fine, everything's fine. So now, let's test the next level. Let's write an HTTP controller. So here, I'm gonna create a reservation HTTP test. I'm gonna, I'm gonna test that I can correctly um, uh, make a request to the web service and get a response back as I expect to. I'm going to assert certain things about the shape of the response. And here, I'll use the webflux test, okay? So I'm going to say, at test public void get throws exception. And I'm going to use the auto-wired private web client, web test client here. And here, I'll say this dot web test client dot get dot URI local host uh, 8080 forward slash reservation. So I'm just trying to prove that I'm, when I make a request here that certain things ex, uh, return the way I expect them to. I'm expecting that the uh, body or that the header will have a content type equals to media application JSON. I'm expecting that the status will be okay. And I'm expecting that the body will match a certain shape. I'm expecting that it'll match a certain shape that I can prove using JSON path, okay? So I'm saying that the, na the first element in the JSON array that comes back will have a name attribute that is equal to Jane. And I wanna prove that it exists, okay? So there's my simple test. Let's see if this works. We can see, we know this is not gonna work, but let's see if it fails and see why it fails. The first thing I can think of is that, of course, we haven't built the HTTP endpoint. That doesn't exist, right? So, did we get a 404 basically? Yeah, 404. Okay, so there's no data type, there's no endpoint there to talk to. So let's actually go ahead and build that uh, endpoint in the main production code. So, voila. And you can just build a reservation HTTP configuration. And this is going to be just a spring configuration class, okay, that will uh, return a router function. It's a functional reactive endpoint. So server response routes, return router, uh, routes, okay, I need to actually, it's routes, I always get these confused, there we go, good, build, and we're going to say, when somebody makes this call to this endpoint, forward slash reservations, then I want this handler, this handler function to be invoked, so we're going to say server response dot okay dot body, and I'm going to inject the reservation repository, rr, so here's this, dot find all, reservation.class, and so on, okay? Replace that with a lambda. We can use uh, R, use this with a static import. Good stuff, okay? There's my functional reactive HTTP endpoint. In order to test this, I'm gonna bring this into scope. I'm gonna bring it into the test. So here we are, and let's see what happens. I think this will still fail. What about you? Now, what's gonna happen is it's gonna call that HTTP endpoint, or it's gonna try, but it says it couldn't even start up because there's a bean of type reservation repository that was not available. So it, it tried to inject here in the reservation HTTP configuration, it tried to inject this collaborating object, this reservation repository object. It tried to inject that, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't available. That's because we're using a test slice. This test slice isolates only the things that have to do with the web tier, and it discards everything else, okay? So we need to actually provide that object. The normal way we would do this is we'd create a mock, right? If you have a, an object, uh, a test like this, we have collaborating objects that you need, you create a mock. But of course, this is Spring, so we need to actually create a mock and then make it available for injection so that other components in the system can find it. Well, okay, uh, we could create a class, uh, like a configuration class, I guess, but a really nice thing that you can do for the last four years is something called mock bean. And what this does is it creates a mockito mock 
for a spring t for a bean, it creates this, it looks at this field. It says, oh, I'm going to find any bean in the application context of this type. If it exists, I'll replace it. If it doesn't exist, I'll add it, and it's going to be a mock keto mock. Okay, so now I've got a mock, and I said I've been saying mock all this time, but that's not the right term, is it? Well, I don't want a mock. What I need is a stub. A mock is an empty object that returns zero, null, false, etc. What I want is a thing that responds in a pre-programmed way. So I'm going to say, okay, mockito. Dot when this dot find all, then return flux dot just, and I'm going to return a new reservation like that. Okay, so there's my rewritten test. Run that code again. Good stuff. So now we're able to prove that the reactive HTTP server started up, and that when a JSON request, or sorry, an HTTP request came in, that we got a JSON response that matches the shape. It has the shape of the thing that we want. It's green, so good. Now, let's build a consumer, okay? We'll go back to the consumer here and build a consumer. And here, I don't need the MongoDB support, of course. Don't need that, but I do want the stub runner, okay? So we hit generate and consumer.zip. Come on. Now, this is going to be a thing that has a client. It's going to imagine in your organization you have a service and you want to distribute a client that people can use to talk to your service. It's just HTTP, so they could create their own client, but it's nice to not have to reinvent all of that each time. So you can distribute a sort of blessed client that people can use if they want. So we're going to build that. Okay. So one of the nice keep commands uh, in uh, the uh, IntelliJ IDE is that you can just do Command Shift T on a Mac, and I'm sure there's an equivalent on one of those non-Mac uh, operating systems, and it'll take you to the test that matches the production code. So here, I've got consumer application test, command shift T, back to this, consumer application, command shift T, back to that, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a JUnit4 test, voila, uh, and I'll say spring runner.class. What I'm going to do is I'm going to test that I can create a client that can talk to my service. So reservation repository, repository, okay? There's the repository, uh, sorry, reservation client, isn't it? I want a reservation client, and that client is going to be a thing that allows me to talk to that service. It doesn't exist, so I'll create it there. It's going to have a method here. I'm going to say uh, uh, this.client.get all reservations. Okay, whoops, and there's no data there, there's no method there, so it's going to fail. I'll create a publisher of reservations, like so. Okay, now. This type, I'll create that there. I'll return the data type. You can see that this is red. It's failing because there's no type in the class path. I'll create that DTO, that client side representation here. So ID and reservation name. And we'll use the usual suspects. We'll use Lumbach here to make short work of that. Good. So there's my reactive client code. A couple things I need to make this work. Well, I can make that public, actually. It's fair to do that. Uh, but I want this to be a component. Okay. Uh, and I want to now assert certain things about the request. Reservations <clears throat> dot expect next matches. I'm going to say I'm expecting that r dot get ID will be non null, and r dot get reservation name will be equal to Jane. Okay, I'm going to expect that result to come back that way. And we can already we already know that this is going to fail for a few reasons, right? Let's let's think about some of the reasons. First of all, there's no, it's going to return null, so I need a reactive web client to do my work here to make the HTTP call. I need to inject that into the constructor, so I can do that here. I can say return this dot client dot get dot uri HTTP localhost eighty eighty forward slash reservations. Uh, I can return a, 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 a stream of values back as a publisher, a reactive publisher. And uh, there we go. So this is still going to fail because I don't have that bean of that type. So we can go back to the production code and factory a bean of type web client. Okay, web client dot builder builder return builder dot build. Now run this test one more time. Okay. Oh wrong. Oh this is, this gets me every time. This is Jane at five. And that JN at 5 annotation is totally different from the one you should use from JN at 4. So here we go. All right. It still failed, didn't it? Look at that. Now, why do you suppose it failed? Hmm? 
I made the call to the service on port 8080, and I got a connection refused. So this, my friends, is where we have to have a quick discussion about culture. So I don't know what it's like here in beautiful Antwerp and beautiful Belgium, but where I come from, I live in the States in a small village in Northern California called San Francisco. And in San Francisco, uh, we're very close to Silicon Valley, right? We're kind of, a, we're kind of the, uh, the city next to Silicon Valley, right? And um, I mean, the, you know, with tall buildings and stuff. And in San Francisco, culture is a little different. We're in my organization, in, in, in an organization in Silicon Valley, if somebody is a new employee in your organization and they come to work with you in your organization, it's very polite, it's very friendly to say to them, hello, welcome, come on in, have a seat, here's a cup of coffee. It's a very polite, welcoming uh, thing to do. It, 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 it's a very friendly thing to do in my culture, in where I come from, and I don't know what it's like here. On the other hand, on the other hand, in my culture, where I come from, it, it can be very vulgar, very rude, very offensive to say to someone who's brand new in your organization, who's just started their first day in your organization, it can be very offensive to say, hello, welcome, come on in, have a seat, here's a cup of coffee. And also, you need to deploy this Kubernetes cluster just to test your, your client. It's very offensive, very offensive. People will quit your job. They'll give you the middle finger and then leave. Right? Very rude. Nobody wants to be told that I need to deploy a Kubernetes cluster just to test something. Right? And that's the problem that we're in right now. If you think about what we do with testing, you have a test pyramid. At the bottom of the test pyramid are your fast feedback tests that give you validation about what you're doing. And as you move further into the code, as you move more towards the system and less towards the components, you have more slow uh, tests. These are slower, that slower tests that take longer to validate. They're, they're not as fast. And the goal is that they're just there to catch the small things that you might have missed in the 80% case of the fast feedback unit tests at the bottom of the pyramid. So you should have like 20% slow, slow tests, like uh, integration tests, end-to-end -end tests, uh, etc. And you should have mostly fast feedback unit tests. But when you move to microservices, things get turned around, don't they? Now, suddenly, interactions with one component to another are now HTTP calls. They're network calls. In order to get any one little thing working, you need to deploy a new service and get it running. This becomes very untenable. I have a MacBook Pro uh, 2018 with 32 gigs of RAM. Okay? And I bought this last year just so that I could run Slack and Chrome at the same time. <laughs> I can't. It's not, it's not enough yet. But my hope was that it would also be able to run a Kubernetes cluster. Not there either. There is, however, a MacBook Pro, I'm uh, sorry, a Mac Pro with 1.5 terabytes of RAM. And this, as I understand it, I saw in the fine print, also runs Slack and Chrome. So I'm very excited about that. Maybe it'll be enough to run your production system. But in the meantime, in the meantime, it's not really an option, right? We, don't, we can't all take Mac Pros around wherever we go, especially at that price, $32,000. So instead, what I want to do is I want to mock out that service. One way to mock out that service would be use wiremock. So you say wiremock stub for wiremock a response, sorry, wiremock.git, wiremock.url forward slash reservations will return wiremock a response dot with body, with header, and with status. So http status dot okay dot value, okay? And my header is http headers. Content type is going to be media type. Uh, application JSON value, and then the body is going to be a string of some sort. Okay, so I'm going to use var JSON equals, and I can't wait for multi-line strings to be real. But in the meantime, here's what we have to do. Okay, so okay, so uh, this is the ID. And there's the name. So name will be. Uh, Reservation name, that's what it is. Reservation name will be equal to Jane. And the ID will be equal to 1. Okay? So there's the JSON. There's the body. And whoop, body, JSON. There we go. 
And of course, you should probably format it a little differently. I just took the path of least resistance and just left them all on the same line. You could do better. This is not our API. It's a third-party API. WireMock will actually stand up a uh, mock HTTP server. It's an actual HTTP server, but it'll provide a, a mock pre-programmed response. It's like a stub, but for a network service. Okay. So if I use that, I can then just say at auto configure WireMock. Okay. Port equals 8080, and then run the test again. Okay. Okay, that worked. Okay, so that worked. That's great. So now I've got a green client and I've got a green service. Are we done? Can we go to production yet? Or home at least? And the answer is no, right? You see, even though these are both quick and they're both green, there's a bug. And this bug would not have been caught without an integration test. All this time, I have made a mistake. I didn't realize it, but it says reservation name when it should have said name, right? So on the consumer side, it says reservation name. On the producer here, it says name. So everything's green on both sides, and yet nothing would work. Wiremock is great for if you have a stable API, for talking to like the OAuth API, right? That's a very stable structure. It's not going to change from one day to another. Uh, it's, it's very different, for example, if you're talking to another API in your organization, or like Facebook's API, which changes every five minutes, right? Like that's not a good API to use Wiremark for. You want something stable, okay? Um, but if you have two different teams working on something, then you, what you want is some way to validate that when something changes over there that your code is, uh, is uh, adjusted to accommodate that. And in a monolith, if something breaks over there, your compiler will say, hey, this field, this method, whatever, no longer exists. The compiler will tell you. We don't have a compiler that tells us about breaks in network APIs. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Spring Cloud Contract. Spring Cloud Contract gives you that compilation step. It gives you a way to say, hey, this thing that you were depending on has broken. And it also gives you a way to create a test for your service. Okay? Now, I'm going to use Spring Cloud Contract here in the producer. But you don't have to. You can actually use Spring Cloud Contract in an intermediate repository. You can have like a diamond sort of structure. We have a producer and a consumer, and they share a contracts uh, directory. A contract uh, is, a, is a file. It's a DSL. It's a definition of a request and a response that matches one particular exchange that you expect to be maintained to continue to work. You can define the contract in the producer side or on the consumer side or in the shared place, whatever you want. But it's supposed to define one interaction that you expect to work. In order to do this, um, you write a definition, you write a DSL, you use a DSL, and it gets transpiled into a test. So this test actually runs against your API, the producer API in this case. The test looks, it does almost the same thing as your reservation HTTP test. It's actually going to make a request to the URL that asserts certain things about the response, about the structure of the JSON, etc. So actually, you could write a contract instead of writing this HTTP test if you want. But here we go. So I've got this folder here called source main resources contract. I'm going to use the Groovy DSL. Okay? You can use the Groovy one. There's a Kotlin one. There's even a Java one. You could use, you could use, you could use YAML. <laughs> but then you'd need a test for your test. So uh, I wouldn't do that. Um, uh, so here we go. You say contract dot make. Okay? And notice this is just Groovy API. You can call the methods, right? These are actually methods on different objects. So I'm going to say, okay, description should return all reservations. And then the request is going to be, I'm going to match a request that has a method type get. The URL will be to forward slash reservations. And the response will be to, uh, well, the response will have a status, HTTP status. Dot OK dot value. The uh, headers will have a content type that we expect. So media type, uh, not, not that one, media type dot application JSON. And the body will look like this. Now you could provide a string, but in Groovy, you can create a, a list literal by just saying bracket bracket, and you can create another object by saying, by doing this, for example. Now, it's like a map, at basically, at this point, right? So I get an attribute and a value. It looks kind of like JSON. It's not JSON. It's, it's groovy. But, you know, same idea. Um, and so there's my definition. Now, when I generated this project and I chose to have the Spring Cloud, Cloud Contract Verifier on the class path, it automatically added that for me, and it configured a plugin. Now, this plugin is optimized right now for JNet 5. I am going to optimize it for JNet 4 in my reactive code. Um, 
I'm going to say it's explicit. Keep in mind, this contract will be turned into a contract at compile time. That contract will, well, that, that test, it'll be turned into a test at compile time, rather. That test has no idea about Spring. It doesn't know about our mock bean. It doesn't know about the reservation repository that we've mocked out. It doesn't know about any of that. So we need to do some of the setup work to make this contract work. So you, need to pro you, you can do it a number of different ways. One of the easiest is just to provide a base class. And there's a lot of different ways to provide base classes. You can say, here's a base class for all the tests in this package. Here's a base class based on a pattern. Here's a base class for all the tests, uh, etc. But whatever you do, you need to provide one, or at least you probably should. So here's my base class. And my base class is just going to be a Spring Boot test for now, just to make sure we get it working. The Spring Boot test is going to start up the web, the application in context on a random port. So there's two different ways to do that, right? Server port equals zero or web environment equals random port. Uh, I need to bring in the HTTP endpoint, right? The HTTP configuration. So I'll do that as well. Uh, and I'm going to run this with the Spring Runner, okay? As usual, dot class. In the before method, I'm going to do as I did before. I'm going to go to the reservation HTTP test, and uh, I'll set up Makito, right? So I'm going to say mock bean, private reservation repository, good. OK, and there's this. The only, thing I, only other thing I need to do is I need to tell my test framework uh, about what port uh, the, the, the random web server has started up on. So I'm going to say rest assured dot base URI equals HTTP localhost colon this dot port. Okay, there's my base URI. And there's my base class. So I need to configure that in the build here. So here's the build. I'm going to say com example producer base class. Okay, now we go to the, the uh, producer side on the build. Producer maven clean install. And let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Wait for it. Hopefully it works. Hopefully my tests are all green. Fingers and eyes crossed. So excited. Okay, so there we go. We saw it worked. We can see that it did uh, a bunch of things. It, first of all, it installed a jar. It installed a palm.xml and it installed a stubs jar. We're going to come back to that in a second. It, what you need to know is that it also created that contract verifier test, which is actually a you know, a transpilation, if you will, of our contract. So here's this. Cat, that, and then you can see this, this is a test that was generated based on our contract. It extends base class, and it says, given HTTP request to reservations, expect status code is 200, expect this JSON type, and expect the JSON structure to look like that. Right? And you can create one contract or thousands of them. They're cheap, they're lightweight, and they get run against your API, your producer server-side API. If this contract didn't work, your build would fail, okay? So this contract is now green, and we've done clean install, but you're not normally going to do clean install, are you? You're going to do get, you're going to do Maven clean package on your local machine or Maven clean test, and then you're going to do git commit, and it's going to go through your continuous integration environment, and when it goes to continuous integration, it's going to be de deployed to Artifactory or some other, uh, you know, Artifact repository, right? You're going to just share that in your organization. That's going to be the communication mechanism for other teams in your organization to find this contract, and you've already installed the contract. Remember what we set up here, we've installed the stubs, right? So you're going to do, you're going to deploy it to your Artifact repository, and then you're going to deploy it to production. That's continuous delivery. So the thing that's in production right now, if your tests are green, is your producer API. So what we want is on the client side, we want to use this contract, which is now communicated to other people in the organization through the artifact repository. We want to use the latest one, okay? In my case, I'm just using local M2 as my artifactory, but it's nowhere near as good, and other people in the organization can't see it, okay? So uh, now, on the consumer side, on my test, I want to use that contract to validate what I've done. I can just remove Wiremock, remove Wiremock, and I can say auto configure stub runner. And here, I'm going to provide the Maven coordinates for my contract definition. It's going to load the Maven coordinates at test time, right? It's not at compile time. I'm going to tell it to find the goop ID is com example, the artifact ID producer, find the latest version, and then run it on port 8080. I'm also going to tell it where to find it. So by default, you know, it may not be what you want. You can do it on the class path. It can be on lo local, which is local M2, or like your artifactory or Nexus, okay? In my case, I'm using local. So now I can run this code again, having commented out Wiremock, 
And what I've got is actually a definition in my artifact repository. And you can see that it failed, right? We know that it failed because we can see it failed because got a null pointer. Reservation name equals null. That's our bug. We got a bug, right? So we found it thanks to this contract. We know we can fix this, fix that, run this again, and there you go. So let's see if that works. Now, one question that people often ask is, okay, well, Josh, there's the green test, good. One people often ask is, well, Josh, not all people are lucky enough to be using uh, Spring and, uh, and Spring Cloud Contract. I've heard about a hypothetical that's kind of scary. It's sort of like the Higgs boson particle. It's unconfirmed. People haven't proven it to me yet, but it's theoretically possible, right? They've confirmed the Higgs boson particle. I've still, yeah, I still yet, I'm still unconvinced. Apparently, it's, it's possible, theoretically, to write software that doesn't use Java and Spring. Now, again, nobody's proven it to me, but in that hypothetical eventuality, uh, this annotation, this auto-configure stub runner, wouldn't be what you want. So in this case, we have a nice uh, convenience library that you can use here called the Spring Cloud Contract, Contract Stub Runner Boot Jar. And you can use the jars just like this, right? So I'm going to say do it. And when you, when, when you run it, it does Java minus jar, runs the jar. It says stub runner work offline equals true, stubs mode equals local. And here's the coordinates for the, the jar and the port and all that, just like in the annotation. And what that does is it creates an actual mock HTTP service that you can use that has the pre-programmed responses from your contracts. So you don't have to deploy your Kubernetes cluster, right? It has all the endpoints that you have contracts for, and it creates those things for you automatically. Now, Spring Cloud Contract, I've just begun to scratch the surface here. We could have done so much more. We could have done wildcard responses and, and input values. We could have done this for messaging, for Kafka, right? If you have producer and consumer in the Kafka world, that is a contract, and these things can be described in Spring Cloud Contract as well. We can also support packed contract definitions as well. Uh, there's all sorts of things that you could do with Spring Cloud Contract. Open API, Swagger, that kind of thing, those can be used as well. So Spring Cloud Contract is a very, uh, very, very uh, big topic and we've just got very little time. So I hope, my friends, that you've learned today uh, how to write code, how to be more confident in your journey to production. Remember, it is a really nice place, best place in the world, happiest place on earth, ha better than any other place you've ever been, I assure you. So thank you, my friends, for coming and for hanging out. Uh, who had fun? Just curious. Good stuff. Who learned something new? Ah, oh, good stuff. I love it. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, DevOps.